Good morning. My name is Corey Arnold, and I'm the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. Happy Memorial Day weekend to you and your family. Thank you to all of those who have served, especially to those families with members who gave the ultimate sacrifice in the service of our country. The church office will be closed tomorrow in recognition of the holiday. Online giving is now available through the church website using the member portal login. If you have any questions about online giving, please contact the church office. The June edition of Table Talk magazine is available in the box outside of the entryway. The next edition of Our Daily Bread is on back order, but it, it will hopefully arrive soon. Once it does, we will inform you when they are available for pickup. Fireside chats will continue on Tuesday and Friday this week, as well as the virtual prayer meeting and TFC meeting on Wednesday. Allow this to be a reminder to remove any distractions so we can worship our great God. Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2. Please listen as I read. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Let's pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we're so blessed to be able to worship, to be able to worship a God who's done so many wonderful deeds. Lord, allow us to sing praise to your name, to bring glory to your name through our worship. Lord, humble us. Allow us to hear from your word and allow us to have hearts that are ready to apply the message. Lord, thank you for this time of worship and allow it to be pleasing to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, I'm the assistant pastor, Tim Radcliffe. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 46. I invite you to turn there if you have Bibles of your own and to follow along as I read this great Psalm. Again, we're in Psalm 46 and we'll be reading the entire Psalm. Follow along with me. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth, how he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, we, we come to you now and having just read your word, we, we come with nothing but thanksgiving in our hearts, with great thankfulness because of who you are and who you have shown yourself to be. We think of the words of this psalm, of the great God that you have proven to be over the, over the many centuries, and yet the God of the nations, the one who is over all things, the one who upholds the sea, the one who upholds the universe by your own hand. You call yourself our God and our fortress. You have not left us alone. You have not left us to our own devices, but you are there and you hear us when we call. And so we think of who you are and the power that you have, the glory that you have, and also the relationship that we have with you and our hearts overflow with thanksgiving. We are so thankful for, for the fact that you have come near to us, that you have revealed to us your son and, and your will for salvation, your plan that, that you have set in motion. 
We thank you that you have drawn us to yourself, that we have become the sheep of your pasture and the people of your hand. Lord, we, we know that you are a great God and that you are a powerful God. We, we praise you for that. We rest on you knowing that we can trust you because you have been faithful forever. We thank you for that promise, especially now as we look around and we see that things are not the way that we want them to be. The world seems to be in danger. The world is in chaos. But even as we read in this psalm, you are greater than the chaos. Your hand is, is over all the nations. And so as we look around us and as we see fear and sickness, we know that you are still in control. At times, that, that does not mean that you, will, that you will come and miraculously take away this illness, but we know that it means that you can still be trusted, that you will be faithful to your promises to uphold us, to strengthen us in spirit, to bring comfort to those who need it. And so we rest on you. We rest in your power, and we trust that you will give comfort to those who need it, and you will bring salvation we praise you for this, Lord. We pray now that as we turn our attention to your word, that you would speak through your servant, that the words that we hear in this sermon would impact our hearts and would change our lives, even as we seek to take the hope of the gospel and share it with those around us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Greetings in the Lord, dear brothers and sisters. What a privilege it is to be together. I know we're not together, and I really miss being together, but we are gathered around God's word. Our God is still sovereign, ruling over the heavens and the earth, and we know that we are his children, bought by the blood of Christ, and we have so much to look forward to. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as I read your word in Isaiah, it says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Lord, this is your word. Your word goes out with power. Your word achieves the purposes for which you have given it. So send your word this morning. May it be powerful and effective. May it reach to our very hearts and, our, and pierce our minds and open our ears and, uh, and unstop our eyes so we can see. Lord, open your word to us and may we be eager to receive it. This we pray in Jesus' name, asking your blessing on our time in the scriptures. Amen. I would ask that you would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We're going to read just a short passage this morning, just three verses. There are even verses that we, we might be tempted to skip past. They don't immediately grab our attention, especially, especially since they appear between the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ and the miraculous events that accompany Pentecost. But there's something here that's very important for us to see as we continue to focus our attention on the permanent prevailing church. What things demonstrate that we are the kind of church that Jesus is building, the kind of church that will last and against which the gates of hell shall not prevail? Well, the first thing that we see is found in these three verses we're going to study together, and our text is Acts 1 verses 12 through 14. Jesus has just ascended into glory. His earthly ministry is complete and he is returning to heaven victoriously. The apostles have just watched him rise and, and rise and rise and then disappear in a cloud. This leaves them with the what now question. They've heard two men 
most likely angels, say to them, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Now that question implies a particular answer. Why do you stand looking into heaven implies that what they're really saying is, stop doing that. You can't keep looking into heaven with the expectation that in a short time, Jesus will appear again. But it also implies a, a follow-up consideration. What do we do now? Well, Luke, the writer of Acts, in these three verses, gives us their response. So let's read Acts 1, 12 through 14 together. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near the city, a Sabbath's day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. This is the response of waiting. Waiting is something with which we should be well acquainted, for it seems that waiting is all we've been doing for the last 10 or 11 weeks. We're, we're, we're waiting. We don't know what happens next or even what it looks like. We rightly conclude that God has a purpose for even this because God has a purpose for everything that happens and he even causes bad things to work together for the good of his children, according to Romans 8, 28. So it seems that God has mandated a time of waiting during this pandemic, but, but how do we wait? And what do we do while we wait? Well, what we learn from our text is that waiting is not idleness. The disciples are clearly in a position of waiting, but they're not idle. They're not just sitting around. They're not just dormant like hibernating bears. They've been told by Jesus in verse 4 that they're not to leave Jerusalem, but are to wait. They're to wait for the promise of the Father, which Jesus has assured them in verse 5 is just over the horizon, not many days from now. And Jesus has given the further direction in verse 8 that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That, that's their mission. That's the church's marching orders. It is the Great Commission. It's the same command that Jesus gave in Matthew 28. Go as you go testify to Jesus, make disciples of all nations. That's the mission. But now put yourself in the apostles' shoes. They didn't have the advantage of knowing what we know. They know the command to stay in Jerusalem. They heard Jesus talk about the giving of the Holy Spirit. And then they heard the mission, you will be my witnesses. Have we lost sight of the immensity of the mission for these first Christians? There are only, according to verse 15, 120 of them. Ten dozen committed followers of Jesus who see him as Lord, Savior, and God, and have committed themselves to live in obedience to Jesus. That's all there are. To them has been given the mission of bearing witness to Jesus, starting in Jerusalem. May I remind you that it was in Jerusalem just 40 days earlier that Jesus was betrayed and arrested. And a crowd shouted, crucified him, and that crowd even overruled the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who wanted to free him. It's in Jerusalem that Jesus is put to death, but they're still supposed to bear witness to Jesus in Jerusalem, let alone Judea bigger circle, let alone Samaria, bigger circle still, and let alone the end of the earth, widest possible circle. These 11 apostles and a tiny church of 120 are supposed to do that? How's that even possible? Do they believe that God can even accomplish that? And if so, how? And so they wait. 
As it turns out, their waiting is going to last 10 days. Do, do the math. Jesus is crucified and rises from the dead at Passover. The risen Jesus spends 40 days before ascending to glory. Pentecost is a festival that takes place 50 days after Passover. So there are 10 days of waiting from the time of the ascension of Jesus to the Holy Spirit's arrival at Pentecost. Not that they know this exactly, but they do know that the gift of the Spirit is going to be a wait of not many days. They're consigned to waiting. But how are they going to use this time? This is important for us to see, my friends. These first believers were waiting, and, and we're waiting. What's next for us? If you think that we're going to immediately go back to church as is, that is not very realistic. But, but is God doing something? Of course he is. So how do we wait, and what do we do as we are waiting? Here in Acts 1, 12 through 14, we see what the early church did as it waited. And it's what we should be doing as we wait to see what God will do and what he wants for us as a church. What did the first Christians do while they were waiting? They committed themselves to prayer. The church of Jesus Christ was literally birthed in prayer. Prayer was the church's first activity. And this is not just an incidental detail. We need to learn from this because what these first Christians did mattered. In just 10 days, the church is going to experience an explosion of growth. 3,000 souls will be saved and added to the church in just one day. What the first Christians did as they waited is not unrelated to what happens at Pentecost. Prayer prepared the soil. Prayer strengthened Peter to preach the sermon that God used to bring 3,000 people to salvation. So prayer matters. And we need to know that. Who's praying? The apostles return to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. It's called a Sabbath day's journey away. You're only allowed to walk so far on the Sabbath, so this is a walk of maybe three quarters of a mile. But the point that is being made here is that these are people who are obedient to Jesus. Jesus told them not to leave Jerusalem, so they make sure that they don't. Now, prayer fits into this, this mindset of obedience. People who pray the way these folks do are really interested in what Jesus wants for them. They're serious about obedience. Implied in that is if you're really um, not all that interested in knowing God's will and obeying it, you won't be as committed to prayer because prayer and obedience go together. Prayer and the desire to, obe to obey Jesus, they fit together. Now, when they arrive back in Jerusalem, they return to the upper room where they're staying together. Now, the question we immediately ask is, is this the upper room? Is this the upper room where the Lord has instituted the Lord's Supper on the night Jesus is betrayed? Many houses had upper rooms. But it would seem that we're supposed to think that this was that room. And if that's the case, it, if that's the case, imagine that now they're together in the same place where they had spent precious time with Jesus, except that now Jesus is no longer there. But if this is that upper room, it's the same place where they heard Jesus say in John 14, verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. So try being the fly on the wall as they're gathered in the upper room. What do we do now? Jesus has told us to wait here in Jerusalem. We're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I can't even imagine what that's going to be like. We're going to be Christ's witnesses everywhere. That scares me to death. How is God ever going to accomplish that through us? And we're going to do greater works than the master did? That seems impossible. That, that's what, it like, what it's like probably to be the fly on the wall. 
And by the way, Stephen Lawson says that greater works are not greater in quality, but greater in expanse and greater in breadth. And Jesus says they're going to do greater works even than him? How and what greater works? So we begin with who's here. Well, Luke names all 11 apostles by name. Now, why does he do that? He's, he's already given their names in his gospel. And so does Matthew in his gospel, and so does Mark in his gospel. So why mention them all again? Well, look at the names. There's Peter, obvious leader of the group. It's mentioned first in every list of disciples. And there's James and John and Andrew who are part of Jesus' closest circle of friends. Then there are couplets. We see Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, and then three more. James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas the son of James. Luke is going to deal with who is missing, Judas Iscariot, and how he will be replaced in the next section. But here we see a very few, a few important things simply in the listing of the names. Remind yourself why these people have gathered in the upper room. What's their purpose? They want to receive strength for the mission Jesus has given them. How can they receive that necessary strength? They know of only one means, through prayer. And in verse 14, we see that that's what they're doing. They're praying. But who's praying? The point that Luke is making is that all the apostles are praying. Not just Peter, the leader, but all of them, including those men whose names are on the list, but we hardly ever read of them speaking or doing anything that stands out in the Gospels. They're all engaging in prayer. They all see prayer as absolutely essential to the success of their mission. They're saying, we cannot do this without serious, serious prayer. So this is a prayer meeting. They've gathered for prayer. How long does it last? Luke indicates that it continues until Pentecost. So we have a 10-day prayer meeting. They pray and pray and keep praying until the Lord answers. You know, prayer is so very prevalent throughout the book of Acts. Whenever help is needed, strength is needed, answers are needed, these first Christians, first thing, pray. You can find a good example of it in Acts 12. When Peter is arrested, what does the church do? It says, earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. These are people of prayer, and they will continue to pray until God answers. This rebuts any notion that we might have that prayer is only for the women of the church or the senior saints of the church. These are the church's leaders, and they are front and center when the church gathers for prayer. This is the very first action of the church. The church is birthed in prayer. And who are the first names mentioned? The apostles, the leaders. And their commitment, we see if we read through the book of Acts, is, is an ongoing commitment. Acts 6, for instance when it's determined that the widows need to be cared for, the widows are being neglected, proper care needs to be provided, it's decided that diaconate ministry is needed. But while the apostles considered that work to be of extreme importance, they say in verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so right away we see the church's leaders setting the pace in the area of prayer. This is convicting to me, and it should be. I need to lead in prayer so that this flock sees that prayer is necessary, that is, it's essential to the life and vitality of the church. Without God's support, we can do nothing. But going to God in prayer, we can do everything he wills for us to do. And so we pray. And I feel that I need to be radical and strong on this point because we're living in perilous times as a nation and as God's people. And Grace Church needs to be aligned with God during such a time as this. We need to hear from God. 
We need to commit ourselves afresh to hearing from him and obeying his call. These are scary times, but they can also be times of great vibrancy because God is still God. And so we as, so we as a whole church need a new birth of commitment to prayer. Many years ago, Matthew Henry said that when God designs mercy upon a people, he stirs up corporate prayer in the midst of that people. And Joel Beakey stresses, the church that does not earnestly pray together cannot really hope to see great reformation and revival. Church history has confirmed that. God, when he usually brings revival in a church, precedes that revival with a prayer meeting. So I feel this great burden. If I fail to call this flock to a renewed commitment to prayer, I am shirking my responsibility as your pastor. So we start with the apostles, but the apostles are not the only devotees to prayer, but they were praying, verse 14 says, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus. And this too is important for us to see. Who are these women? Well, it's not hard to surmise that Luke is here referring to the group of women who included those who were the last ones at the cross and the first ones at the empty tomb. He's referring to women who had financial means and used them to support the work of Jesus and the disciples. So we can imagine that this group of women, though they are not named, include Mary Magdalene and Mary and Martha and Joanna and Salome and Susanna and others and Jesus' own mother Mary, who is mentioned here for the final time in Scripture. By the way, would you note that Mary is praying? She is not being prayed to. She is not a dispenser of strength or power. She needs strength and power just as much as every other believer in Jesus does. Luke intentionally mentions the women, I think, because prayer is not only women's work, but prayer is indeed work in which women of faith need to participate. Luke mentions women because their devotion to Jesus lent itself to frequent and fervent prayer. So yes, prayer is for the women of the church. It's for the women of this church. It is a great privilege for women to participate in prayer. But finally, Luke also mentions Jesus' brothers. These would be the Lord's half-brothers, the natural children of Mary and Joseph. Mark 6, verse 3 actually names them. There's James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. James, we know, went on to be the head of the church in Jerusalem and the author of the book of James. Judas wrote the book of Jude. But we also know from the gospel accounts that James, Jesus' brothers didn't believe in Jesus at first and probably for most of his earthly ministry. John 7, verse 5, likely written less than a year before Acts 1 and these events, it's, that verse says simply, for not even his brothers believed in him. But they came to believe in Jesus. Scripture doesn't tell us when, but it's not hard to come to the conclusion that James believed after the risen Jesus appeared to him. That's recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. And then the others were converted in short order. And Luke includes them, not just because they're there, but I think he includes them because they're pretty new to faith in Jesus as Savior and God but they're right there in the middle of this prayer meeting. Praying for the strength, like everyone else, to fulfill, to fulfill a mission that includes them too. So what I would say to you is, if you're a new Christian, do not ever get to thinking that prayer meetings are only for advanced believers. They're for you too. Indeed, prayer is one of the best ways you can know who God is and grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. How are they praying? What Luke writes in verse 14 is instructive about what our prayer should look like. For Luke writes, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. First. It says here that they gathered for the purpose of prayer. The reason given for their gathering together is prayer. Prayer is the only listed activity as they wait for these 10 days. Could they have prayed on their own? 
Well, certainly. But they saw the necessity and the benefit of coming together for prayer. There are many, many benefits to praying together. Besides the many ends of prayer, what God's answers accomplish, prayer is more essential to our spiritual growth as Christians than I think we often realize. How often I have grown in my adoration of God and appreciation of my fellow believers simply by going to prayer meeting and listening to others pray. I started attending prayer meetings as a teenager. I hardly ever opened my mouth. I know that's hard to believe, but I was a shy kid. I, but as I sat and as I listened, I was overwhelmed by how much the older people at church knew about the Bible. And that when they prayed, scripture just sort of oozed from them. And it wasn't just a regurgitation of Bible verses either. They prayed to God as if they actually knew God. And as I listened week after week, it hit me. I want to know God in the same way that they know him. My friends, that is a desire that God is going to honor. Luke says that they gathered specifically to seek God's will and to drink of God's grace and to be strengthened as they prayed together. These are still reasons to gather for prayer, as, as we do on Wednesday evenings when we have prayer meeting and at other times when we engage in corporate prayer. Verse 14 also tells us that as they came together, they were of one accord. That means that they were single-minded. The Greek word literally means with one mind or with one passion. This is a theme that's repeated throughout the New Testament. It's the theme of the unity of God's people as they gather for prayer. And that should make perfect sense to us, for as we submit our will and our plans to God's perfect will and God's perfect plans, as we draw closer to God, we're also going to draw closer to each other. We're going to increasingly think alike in the sense of having the same goals, wanting the same things, asking God to use us in the same ways. Of one accord speaks of mutual commitment. They not only want the same things, they want to want the same things. And this isn't about one person pressing his own agenda and asking God to bless it. No, together they are together. They're seeking God's will for them as a whole church and for the strength to obey God's will. And that brings them to a single-mindedness that is going to be crucially important for their mission. It doesn't mean that they're not going to have disagreements. May I remind you that these are still sinners just like you and I are? They have difficult decisions to make, just as we in every other church has difficult decisions to make. But unity grows as we pray together. So what are some of the things that they prayed about? Well, the surrounding text gives us a pretty good indication. They prayed to recognize what the coming of the Holy Spirit would look like. They'd heard that they were going to be receiving the Holy Spirit, but, but may I remind you that it's easy to look back from Pentecost from our after-the-fact perspective and understand what that looks like, but they didn't have that. They only had a promise. They prayed for courage to be bold witnesses. It had to be terrifying to know that Jesus was calling them to testify for him in hostile environments like Jerusalem, like Samaria, and to the end of the earth. May I remind you most of these men are Galilean fishermen. To use a fishing analogy, they had to feel like very small fish in a very large ocean, feeling helpless, feeling inadequate. They prayed for strength. They no longer prayed with Jesus at their side, but instead prayed in the name of Jesus. How strange that had to be after having had him teach them how to pray and having had them pray with him at their side for three full years, and now they pray in Jesus' name. What does that mean? Well, praying in Jesus' name isn't just something we tag on at the end of our prayers, like a formula that helps ensure that God will answer. To quote Stephen Lawson, he says, to pray in the name of Jesus means that we pray for the things that will glorify the name of Jesus, not glorify us, or glorify anything around us, but honor and glorify him. 
They also prayed concerning a big decision that was pressing upon them. It's clear from scripture that the number of the apostles is supposed to be 12, but there are only 11 at this time. For Judas has betrayed Jesus and then has taken his own life. What a shock that must have been. The pain is still fresh. For while the gospel writers will later all write, and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him, at this point, it's shocking. It's painful, and it's still fresh. For Judas is one of their close friends, and now he's dead. He's betrayed the master, and then he's killed himself. How do we replace him? Who replaces him? These are big matters. And so they pray. And I think they also prayed about what is the shape of the church? What does the church actually look like? We know what it looks like, but all they know is that they're going to stay in Jerusalem and they'll receive power. Beyond that, all they can see is the greatness of the task and their own inadequacies. And so they pray fervently. Again, how do they deal with all these pressing matters? They pray, and as verse 14 tells us, they keep praying. They prayed and prayed and prayed some more. They were devoting themselves to prayer. We tend to look at prayer as a last resort. They looked at prayer as a first recourse. The first action of the early church is persistent prayer. How foreign this sounds to so many of us. We pray for something and we expect God to answer immediately. We pray once, twice, perhaps even for a week or two, and then we stop and we say to ourselves, well, I guess God isn't answering my prayer. But that's not what those early Christians did. They took their needs and their fears and their questions to God, and they kept taking them to him up until they're answered at Pentecost. And then what did they do after that? They continued to pray. We're building to something in our study of Acts 1 and 2. We're building to a climax which is found after Peter's sermon. We can see it in chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. In those verses, we see the direct results of Pentecost. And what do we see? What is among the foundational characteristics of these first Christian believers? Let me read, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Within a few days, their prayer regimen has taken even on, it's taken on an order. It's no longer just prayer, it is listed as the prayers. Many theologians believe that that, that there's even an order to their prayers as they come together, that there is, for lack of a better term, a liturgy when they go before God's throne room. There's direction and purpose. Can I say it? Like our prayer meetings. So what we see, even before Pentecost, is the church's commitment to prayer. Brothers and sisters, I don't want this to just be a guilt trip. For who of us actually thinks we pray enough? Prayer is one of those things we know we need to do, and we never get to the point where we feel like we've mastered prayer. Now we can move on to something else, to some other discipline. I don't want this to be a guilt trip, but I think our problem with neglecting prayer is at the stage of want to. We don't want to pray enough. And the reason we don't want to pray is because we don't have a big enough view of God. And by a big view of God, I don't just mean his power and his greatness and his majesty and his sovereignty, but his love for us. This is the God who loved us enough to send his one and only son to die for even sinful old me. This is the God to whom we pray. So would you pray for an increased want to? Start there. There's no more crucial time for us to become devoted to prayer as a church, for we stand at a crossroads. We stand desperately in need of God's help for the end of this pandemic, but also for the courage to believe in God's promises that the gates of hell shall not prevail against his church. My brothers and sisters whom I love, when the first Christians faced fearsome challenges, 
They went to prayer. Will we? Let's pray. Father God, these are fearsome days. We have so many challenges, so many fears, so many causes and reasons for anxiety, but we have a great God. Lord, help us to not try to solve all our problems medically or socially or governmentally, but help us to go to you first. Lord, may it be said of us that prayer for us was not a last resort, but a first recourse. Help us to be quick to go to prayer, individually and together. May we go to prayer seeking your face, seeking your strength, seeking your will. For we know that when we pray in your will, according to your will, desiring your glory, wanting to honor you, to exalt your name, those are prayers you will honor. So help us to increasingly be a praying church. May we look forward to times when we come together to worship, including prayer as worship. Help us to, to greatly, more increasingly desire times when we come together for one single purpose, to come before the throne of grace to receive the mercy and to find the grace that we need to help in times of trouble. Help us to desire, to want to pray together as your people. Lord, put that desire in us. We love you. Help us to love you so much we desire to be in fellowship with you continually in prayer. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. And now hear the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you, and may he give you peace. Amen and amen. God be with you.